thank you for the invitation to speak to this very wide audience indeed. Um, and my talk is it's manifestly about Europe, but of course the title is also about origins and destinations, uh, in part about roots and particularly about identity in the context of Europe. And I want to tackle it in three parts. If I set it out and tell you now, then you can recognize it as we move through the earlier part of the evening before we get to the Q&A. First, I want to establish some basic common ground about Europe and the European Union, and that makes means making clear the distinction between the two, which is fairly obvious, but always worth re re reminding ourselves of. Then I want to go on and talk about identity, and in particular the differences between national and a European identity, as well as what sort of narratives each of those rest on. And then finally, I want to illustrate this sense of growing European identity with the story of the man whose biography I've just written, Richard Kudenhoof Kalegi. Uh, this is the story of a quite extraordinary man who played a key role in the development of United Europe. Uh, and it's really a story which is untold as yet in the UK. This is the first English biography of him and the previous ones in German have been relatively small and not particularly um, revelatory. May I put it that way? Uh, his life and his message, what he did and how he lived, resonate today at least as strongly as they did with his contemporaries earlier in the 20th century. So then first, Europe and the European Union. The underlying point to stress is, uh, it may seem obvious, but always, as I say, worth repeating, Europe is much more than the European Union. Uh, that's what we've just left. We've certainly not left Europe. As a result of Brexit, what has happened is that the bilateral relations of the UK with 27 remaining member states have become much more important. Those bilateral relations, uh, put it this way rather, we as a country should do whatever we can to make the UK's soft diplomacy with each of those 27 states now work much better than it did when we were members of the European community, at which point the bilateral relations were taking a back seat. Uh, and in our own way as individuals, we can still remain engaged as players in those non-state activities, which are part of this bigger union. If we turn to the second and really the main point of my talk, the element of my talk, is the identity uh, that we the identity that we have both nationally and as Europeans. We are, as individuals, of course, still in Europe, still part of Europe. We are still in many networks that are clearly European. It's the government which has cancelled our state's membership of the EU. And uh, lest we forget that, another government can reverse it, dare I say, almost as easily. Uh, meanwhile, Europe remains a stage with thousands of organisations, some political, some technical, some representing interests, some representing ideas, all attempting to share our common experience and further common values. Well beyond the world of politics, European coordination is all around us. Take just three examples straight away, immediate ones. Um, uh, UEFA with the Champions League, the Eurovision Song Contest, which we've just gone through and unsurprisingly scored nil point, uh, and the ecumenical movement between the various churches. Uh, the International European Movement is yet a fourth example, which was mentioned just now by, by Evelyn. What's true of sport, music and religion and of the European movement is equally true of associations of business interests, think CBI and Business Europe, trade unions and the ETUC, and many of the biggest companies, multinationals, wherever they may be based, integ integrate their European activities within their corporate structure. Europe is the focus, is Europe is a marketplace for big players. It's also a meeting place for individuals, and that I think is where we, this audience here in particular will have a role to play. Most of our exchanges are not commercial. They have no price and don't show up in GDP. We shouldn't forget that. There's this great emphasis, important though it is to know what the state is doing, what has done and the major effects on trading and so forth, it is not the whole story by a long chalk. These contacts have grown exponentially over the past couple of generations. From holidays on the continent to school and college exchanges, second homes, twinning arrangements, we are all neighbours in our European neighbourhood. And we're growing increasingly aware of that. Brexit was a political shock, but also a personal wake-up call. You cannot leave it all to the politicians. 
and it's quite right that the international European movement is not leaving it all to the politicians. Civil society and private initiatives have an incredibly important part to play. Brexit also doesn't change the geographic facts of life, quite just like Canute demonstrating that he couldn't hold back the tide, nothing government can say or do will change geography. History is of course different. Uh, history is made up of the stories that we tell ourselves about what we've done, sometimes the stories about what we want to do. Different sorts of narrative are being created around Brexit, both in the UK and in the rest of Europe. The, the, uh, the, the writing of the Brexit negotiations, the history of the Brexit negotiations was done immediately. Michel Barnier's reminiscences are, are out already. That's seen from that side of the channel and people have done the same on this side as well. The national historical narrative is also rooted in what our children are taught in school, as well as in popular and media discourse. School curricula are very slow to change, but there are signs that more international aspects are gaining ground. For instance, just one indicator, the rising number of schools now offering international baccalaureate as opposed to the more specialized version of A-levels and easily, more easily comparable to things which are done on the continent. There are also, <coughs> excuse me, there are also now over 5 million people of European nationality living in Britain. At some stage, they may well also form a coherent voice and press for a rewrite of an English narrative about Europe, as other earlier immigrants, for instance, are now rewriting our narrative about the slave trade. These things will come at different phases, and as yet the five million are not organized to be in a position to do that, but it wouldn't surprise me if in a matter of a few years, there is a press in that group, pressure in that group, for us to rewrite the narrative that we otherwise live with about our relations with Europe, officially with the European Union. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Overall in the European Union, there are of course now more than the 5 million, there are 15 million people or so living in a different country from the one in which they were born, other Europeans that is, in another country from the one in which they were born, that are therefore, there are therefore a lot of alternative narratives written already or being prepared, being cooked as it were, um, and all of them are more European than national. That's a process which has grown exponentially over the last couple of generations. The, the figures were nothing like millions before that. And there are some European states now that use more than one language, <coughs> two or indeed three, uh, and some that share a language with another state. The growth of English as a lingua franca shows clearly that language and state don't necessarily march in step as easily as they used to. Narratives in English in particular have a currency right a long way outside England. For many of, for many of us, however, <coughs> the post-war history in the UK is quite familiar. But we, do we have a shared narrative? Some of the facts are very straightforward. I call them facts, be careful, any historian talking about facts has several takes on facts, but nonetheless, there are some common fa facts in our first take of the story. We are aware how the UK emerged from the war in 1945 triumphant, but virtually bankrupt. It had shared an empire and acquired a commonwealth. Heath took us into the EU in 1973, yeah. and Wilson won a referendum less than three years later on a revised set of the terms of entry. Margaret Thatcher began as a Europhile and ended as a Eurosceptic. And each of the two major political parties has blown hot and cold about membership of the European Union. But you only have to ask a member of either of those two major parties uh, where they stood or stand on that, and they will have various, various inter interpretations as to what was good and what was bad about being hot or being cold about Europe over that period of these two generations. Uh, <clears throat> the, the language of the debate more recently, but there's an element of this even from the start, but from the language of the debate more recently has degenerated into xenophobia and racism. But I think we should be cautious in imagining that the debate about Europe has to be dealt with in very extreme terms like that. Most of our discussion, most of the time, has been fairly reasonable about Europe in the political world. It's only in the more recent years that it's reached the boiling point that we recognize around Brexit. 
in one sense, none of that matters to other European countries. Of course, we'd like them to understand us and understand us better. But when we think about other countries, Italy, France or Germany, for instance, how far have we gone into their history and stood in their shoes the way we would like them to stand in our shoes and understand our history? I'm very, very pleased that, that Evelyn brought up these three books about Germany. Uh, it's, if you read about other countries, you can start to put yourself into the imaginative position of people like us in those countries. And that is the gist of my message this evening. The more people across Europe do that, 15 million automatically do because they live in other countries, and many more do because they're interested and they do more about it. The more we do that, the more we are all Europeans together, as well as being British, German, French, Italian, Spanish, whatever. But the most important thing is that more and more people, almost inevitably, but we should be careful about inevitability in history, more and more people are becoming European par la force des choses. That's what happens. That's what's happening now. And uh, the reversal of Brexit is probably a blip rather than a crisis. Let me not underestimate it, but nonetheless. That's why, in one sense, what's happening now in Hungary and in Poland is more disturbing. Here are governments behaving in ways that the other member states thought had been relegated to the dustbin of history. We thought that wasn't how Europe behaved. In Europe, the rule of law and a free press go hand in hand alongside respect for human rights and democratic procedures. They should be taken as given, as is the peaceful transition of power following free and fair elections. All of those in some way or another are under are at risk in those two countries. To some extent, of course, they're at risk in any country. But the, the norms and the laws and the constitutions, the practices of almost all the countries of Europe respect those values. They're enshrined in the Council of Europe, in its constitution, in the European Declaration on Human Rights, and then upheld by that court. Uh, but the the challenge to them within the moment by Poland and Hungary should give us much cause for thought. We have common values, a reflection of our better selves in many ways, and our task is to hold on to that shared European identity and develop it in common in response to the challenges of coming years. We can identify ourselves as both British and European in sharing those very values. We embrace a European as well as a nat national narrative. So what is it then for us here that makes the European narrative more successful, more inevitable, more in tune with the march of history and eventually more attractive? And I think there are three key reasons. One is one which we hear all the time, though it gets quickly disregarded. One is peace. Europe that we know the organization politically of Europe and the interchange between Europeans going to live in each other's countries massively has come from the ending of war. Out of the conflicts which have torn Europe apart during the last century and earlier has grown a European ideal of unity and diversity. That's the political unity of the European Union, but it is something also which anybody trans crossing borders, especially to go to live in another country, is sharing in. Choosing Europe as opposed to conflict should really be a no-brainer. An ever closer union prevents any one country dominating its neighbours. That is one of the big philosophical steps, if you like, which passed was sold when we negotiated ourselves out of the ever closer union. The next step, as you know full well, was calling a referendum. But the second reason, I think, the key reason why I mentioned three, but this is now the second, the key reason, the second key reason is prosperity and economic growth. You shouldn't neglect this. And the loss of it was not just project fear, the loss of it was quite real. The whole point of being in an association of this size is that in the modern world, you are more likely to maintain your relative wealth position and preferably improve it if you act as a big element, a big element in the global affairs. Acting as a small element doesn't work as well. 
we, we reckon that prosperity and economic growth is a good second reason for being in a, a European unit because we want prosperity and we want it because we came from poverty. All the states of Europe have been much poorer in the past. We easily make the comparison that our salary did or didn't rise by one or two percent or fell by five or ten percent this year or last or next. But what matters is that the overall trend for all our societies has just been to become richer. And that is the good second reason to do it. The, 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 a con, an, a, an ancillary reason, if I may put it that way, is that the political framework of the nation state is becoming less adapted to ensure democratic control of some of the major actors in the creation of wealth, the big transnational corporations. We all need a larger political framework within which the, their activity can be contained or controlled for the greater good of society. And in our region, that happens to be the EU. In the next few weeks or next week or two, we have the G7 uh, about to try and tax uh, companies uh, dealing with the internet at a common minimum rate of 15%. That'll be an informal agreement between groups. The two major players in those groups are the, the EU and the United States of America. Um, we are a lesser player outside the EU. The third reason is that the unity will give Europe a bigger role in the world. Uh, all European states are now small by global standards. And uh, it was Paul Henry Spark, and that was 50 years ago and more, uh, who said that all European states are small, but only some of their leaders realize it. Um, I think that comment still applies in the UK. Um, and the notion that there is a, <clears throat> An expanding global role for Britain is, is really quite illusory. There are things that can be done better and done more strongly by stressing our English heritage, British heritage, whatever element we may wish to stress. But the overall impression that we can make is much less as a single country than it would be contributing to a larger grouping. Um, the reason why we need to express Europe's voice in the world more strongly is precisely to count among the big global players. When there were a few dozen countries that mattered in the world and we were one of them, that was quite different, especially when we had a large empire um, and were among, the, if not the biggest, we were one of the were two very big players. But that's no longer the case to preserve our own way of life, our interests and values, then beyond that, to preserve European way of life, interests and values, you need to be a bigger player than a nation state. And in his day, Richard Kudenhoof Kalergi, his day is more, is now a hundred years ago, a whole century ago in the 1920s, Richard Kudenhoof Kalergi could see that the United States was the rising superpower. The British empire was globally dominant then. Russia was a revolutionary threat and Asia was weak and exploited region, region of the world. Today, China has that role that the US then had. The British Empire is no more and Russia remains a threat. But the chairs move in this international game. Europe will therefore be called on more and more to become what I call the second superpower of the West alongside America. To achieve that, however, we will need more Europe more internal cohesion in policies and decision taking as far as the European Union, as far as the European Union is concerned, but much more dense personal relations as far as all the individuals are concerned. Kutenhoof Kalergi once wrote, and I think the quote is well worth, worth summarizing for you here, um, looking around the world at the way in which people identified with big countries of their region, spoke of all the Indians being able to speak as being Indian, of the Chinese as being able to speak as Chinese, and simply put the question, why don't the Europeans describe themselves as European? Why do they describe themselves as French, Spanish, British, whatever? That's one of the lessons that he teaches us. Um, but we need to see ourselves not only as nationals of whatever country we come from, but also as Europeans. 
in his words, we need to become European patriots. And I was fascinated to see that Michel Barnier used that phrase in his memoirs and his commentary on the Brexit negotiations. So now let me illustrate some of this more general talk on identity and background uh, with the life of Richard Kudnhuk-Kalergi. Uh, obviously, um, uh, th that's uh, very high in front of my mind. And I've sent over a number of photos, uh, slides in my photo presentation uh, to help illustrate what I'm going to talk about. Uh, he lived an adventurous life in extraordinarily turbulent times and created a political movement, uh, the idea of a, which promoted the idea of a united Europe, such as we have today, but it was back in the 1920s. So there's been a great discontinuity was of course then the Second World War. But his views were far, far ahead of his time. And he is much, uh, sadly, uh, he, he is not recognized for, in, in particular here in Britain, but not recognized more generally uh, for the innovative work that he did. He was born at the end of the 19th century, 1894, came of age during the First World War, acted politically in the 20s and died in the 1970s, just about the time that Britain joined the common market. Um, let me show the first slide, if I may. That's the cover of the book. So if you bear that in mind, the um, rather strong title that you see there um, uh, was the publisher's choice from three or four that I put forward to him. He said that if it has Hitler in the title, it'll double the sales. <laughs> but he didn't say from how many to how many. So I, I wait to see what the numbers will be. But this is the picture of the man, uh, a very imposing, a rather handsome man there, I think in his forties in that photo. But he was born of, Austro of an Austro-Hungarian aristocrat with a historic lineage that went back to a dozen different European countries. And his mother was Japanese. Uh, and being an Austro-Hungarian, he lost his homeland in the collapse of empire in 1918. He spent his early years growing up in a castle in rural Bohemia, today the, the Sudetenland, the very western part of Czechoslovakia, before being sent to a prestigious boarding school in Vienna. The Count went into politics as an intellectual, created an alternative political movement to challenge the Nazis, and had a vision for the whole of Europe and for a European identity for everyone who lived there. The second picture, please. This is obviously the man he was up against. It is a young picture of Hitler. Occasionally, people don't even recognize that it's Hitler, but nonetheless, this is Hitler in his young years. The approach of Kutnu Kalergi really worried Hitler. He condemned the Count as a cosmopolitan bastard in the third volume of Mein Kampf. Uh, that's, as I say, the quotation that the publishers took for the, the uh, title. The Count and Hitler actually fought a battle of the books. Two volumes by Hitler, so two volumes of Mein Kampf, and three volumes by uh, the Count, the, the Count Kudenhof Kalergi were published in alternate years in the 1920s, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28. Hitler's Mein Kampf alternating with Kudenhof Kalergi's Mein Kampf um Europa. Yeah? Even in the title, they are competitors. Both were mesmerizing orators in totally different styles, and both were well aware of public relations and had clear views on what propaganda was all about. But the two men stood for diametrically opposed philosophies and policies, and they each knew very well who their enemy was. Number three, please. This is the Count's final resting place, a small graveyard uh, in the Bernese Oberland, not very far from Gestad. And I discovered the grave quite by accident some years ago when I was on holiday walking in the Bernese Overland. At the end of a meadow near a fine old farmhouse is this small piece of land, uh, a private cemetery, separated off by some, what are now some mature trees. And there he is buried alongside two of his three wives. I was intrigued when I discovered it and wanted to know more, but couldn't find very much written, very little indeed, written about him in English. All the sources really are German or French. The farmhouse, uh, let me have the next one then, if I may. That will show us the farmhouse. Here we are, uh, rather typical Swiss chalet type farmhouse uh, near the graves, had been the Count's country home, the only house that he and his first wife ever owned. It was just a short walk from a small station on a single track railway that goes through the mountains there. 
It leads with easy connections anywhere he wanted to go in Europe, east to Vienna, west to Geneva and Paris, north to Berlin and south to Rome. The next one, please. Here we are. The young Count left school in summer 1913, so he's 70, 18, 18 leaving school then, and immediately met this woman, the most famous actress in Vienna at the time, a woman called Ida Roland. She was Jewish, 12 years older than him, already divorced with a five-year-old daughter, and he was starstruck, stage struck as well, and the coup de foudre turned out to be mutual. Despite fierce opposition from his traditionally aristocratic family, the two of them were soon living together and formalized their marriage a couple of years later. His wife's circle of friends and acquaintances was much wider than the narrow social band in which the Count had been brought up. Ida was a pacifist and she helped her young form her young husband's political outlook. He desperately wanted to preserve peace in Europe not to have another disastrous war like the Great War of 1914-18. Manifestly, it was a war in which he'd not fought. He got himself a sick leave ticket on account of weak lungs, which I don't think was very difficult for an aristocratic um, young man to manage to obtain. Uh, but it coincided with his pacifist views, which were very much formed by, by his wife. Alongside this pacifist strand was another idealistic rich strand of thought that coloured the young intellectual's approach to Europe. As Masonic lodges opened after the war, the Count became a Freemason and like them wanted to promote the universal brotherhood of man, an ideal that the French Revolution also embedded in Masonic thinking. So this pacifist route and the, free, the Mason Masonic uh, elements were two key pillars in his if you like, emotional take on where Europe ought to go. So the next picture, please. This is, of course, the, the picture of Europe after the Conference of Versailles, after the collapse of empires, where you have separate countries for Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, East Prussia is still associated there with Germany, uh, Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Romania, Hungary, Yugoslavia, the only union of a number of states there is Yugoslavia, and Austria cut back to a very small rump of what it used to be when it was the leading country of the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, during the war, the Count was studying philosophy and history at the University of Vienna. And after the armistice, the, Victorian, the victorious allies created that dozen new list of a dozen new nation states out of the defeated empires. Czechoslovakia is a new state, Hungary is cut back, Austria cut back, Romania enlarged, uh, Bulgaria essentially a new state, um, Greece uh, going up here in Prussia, yes as I say, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, new states. Um, for this the count was, uh, sorry, big one. During the First World War, he was studying philosophy, correct? After the armistice, the Victorian allies created the dozen new states, but for the Count, this was not the right solution. <laughs> he couldn't undo the Versailles Settlement. There are many people who wanted to undo it. Hitler was one of them, but Hitler wanted to undo it in a quite different way to the way the Count wanted to undo it. Um, all these new nations, as far as the Count was concerned, had to be brought into a single European organization. The Count's reaction was to think not, large, not smaller, but larger, not smaller than at the level of the state, but larger at the level of Europe. As his European father and Asiatic mother had taught him, not to think in nation states, but in terms of whole continents. He and his wife had been citizens of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, at the time only second in size to the Russian Empire. Now that had disappeared. The Versailles settlement made them citizens of Czechoslovakia, but they didn't live there, they lived in Vienna, and in their eyes the new, their new homeland was Europe. The Great War made them European patriots. Pan-Europa would include, that's his idea, was Pan-Europa would include the whole continent, excluding the Soviet Russia and excluding the British Empire, but the whole of the rest of the continent under a single rule of law with a Supreme Court to settle European disputes. So no more war, but peaceful settlement of disputes. Let's see the next cover, please. Next uh, slide. The Count put his ideas down in a book, which he published in October 1923, Pan-Europa. The title says it all. It was his narrative for the growth of Europe as a historical idea and a manifesto for its future as well. 
Pan Europa called for a new political settlement for the continent different from the old empires of the past or the new nationalisms of the present. It became an immediate bestseller. And you can hear from the language I use there how far ahead of his time he is. It's goodbye to the old empires, but everyone else is welcoming the new national, the uh, new nations. The new nationalism is de rigueur. And he's saying, no, you have to go beyond the new nationalism to have a composite of Europe. The next slide, please. Barely 10 days after that book appeared, Hitler led the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich. Here he is going to his trial afterwards, along with some of the people, uniformed ex-army people who were helping him. Ludendorff is on the left. Uh, these two events encapsulate the opposition between what they represented and how they went about their, their tasks. Hitler was a populist who wanted to capture the street. Simple as that. He wanted political power and he'd take it by force if necessary. The Count was an intellectual who wanted to capture men's minds. As simple as that. Uh, they are operating in quite different worlds in one sense, but with the same material. The next picture, please. The core of the Count's message, and this comes back to the third point I was making earlier on, the, the Europe's role in the world, the Count sees that the Europe isn't there just to be peaceful internally, it's there in order to be one of the major world players. Um, Europe indeed should unite, become a federation, then it will be strong again. Internal peace would deliver a world role to the Europeans that they'd lost in the great civil war, as he called it, of 1914-18. This is the, count, the, map, the Count's map of the world, divided into five parts, what he called key power centers, Pan America on the left. The shading you can see for the US covers the whole of South America as well and Alaska. Different, however, from Canada, which is part of the British Empire, the second big, big global player. The Soviet Union, which is shaded in a slightly different way as well. Massive, massive landmass. Uh, and uh, if you see the black area of the map, which is the United Europe, Pan-Europa, and its colonies throughout the world, you have a power which, in his eyes, was comparable to the British Empire. Um, it was a simple and a very attractive message, and he presented it very well, and quickly he gathered an, an enthusiastic following. His first Pan-Europa Congress in Vienna was in 1926, and it brought together over 2,000 leading members, uh, leading figures from the cultural and political elite of Europe. There were more than 20 different nationalities represented there. This was no small feat logistically. In the days when you sent personal invitations by post, or perhaps by telegram, but he and his wife's contacts were so good that for three days he wrote, Vienna was the capital of Europe. Just what he wanted. <laughs> Cue please for the next slide. <clears throat> but it wasn't 2000 good intellectual supporters from the cultural elite he had to persuade. He had to persuade people who ran the big countries of Europe. And here are two of them. On the left, you see Aristide Briand, for many years foreign minister and 10 times prime minister of France and center, center stage, Gustav Stresemann, then foreign minister of Germany. Um, Briand uh, took the Count's pan-Europa ideas. Th these two men, by the way, managed to get on well together despite tremendous tensions between France and Germany in those years. But uh, uh, Briand took the Count's pan-Europa idea and reformulated it in a proposal at the League of Nations in 1929 where he called for a kind of federal link between European states. Uh, he said the only logical way out of the contiguity of states being so close to each other now in Europe, ease of transport, trains and things will get you so quickly to the border, you can move armies around, terrible things that happened in 1418, don't, we don't want that to happen again. The only way to get around that is to have a form of federal link whereby we are all exchanging information with, with the others and letting them inspect us at the same time. In that way, no one will surprise the other by going to war. Uh, for many continental states, this was, of course, an extremely promising idea, but it appeared to London as if the Europeans wanted to join together to rival the British Empire. The UK, which had a dominant role in the League of Nations at the time, kicked the proposal into the long grass, and it wasn't difficult to arrange that. 
while the French government was explaining their quasi-federal proposals to the League, and it took about another year of international negotiation to explain all this with memoranda circulating now, external circumstances also conspired to scupper it. Gustav Stresemann, the German foreign minister, unexpectedly died. Wall Street crashed, the Great Depression started to bite, and the Nazis at the 1930 elections became the second largest party in the Reichstag. The night that Hitler came to power in 1933, the Count was addressing a distinguished private discussion club in Berlin, in, in the same hotel as in which Hitler was holding his pre-accession talks with his proto-cabinet. As the Nazis paraded through the streets, the, the, the Count realized this was going to be the end of Pan-Europa. It would have no future in Germany, and Germany was the most important of the central states that he had to win to make Pan-Europa work. Um, Hitler immediately banned Pan-Europa, seized its assets and burned the Count's books, so there wasn't going to be any support at all. The Count was forced to fall back on Vienna. So the next slide, please. Here are two more men who played key roles in the Count's life and uh, the period of time between 1933 and 1938. Back in Vienna, the Count made a pact with Chancellor Dolphus to protect Austrian foreign interests with his political movement Pan-Europa, and in particular the independence of Austria from Germany. Uh, that would have been disastrous in the Count's eyes because Germany would have become the dominant power in Europe, as indeed it went on to become that, and it would annex adjacent territory as it did with Czechoslovakia and so forth, and thus dominate the whole of Eastern Europe, and that was the very solution that he did not want. So uh, there would be no Anschluss, was the agreement with Dolphus. They would both do their best to stop it. But Pan Europa's offices were in the Hofburg next to the Chancellor's and the Count was closely identified with Dolphus and his form of Austro-Fascism Austro uh, and the opposition parties, the Social Democrats and anyone else to the left of that, condemned the Count as being a man of the right. Uh, he was a proto-fascist in their ideas, in their eyes. Uh, and especially this was so after the brief Austrian civil war in 1934. Dolphus was assassinated shortly after this and the Count supported his successor, Chancellor Schusny, the one on the right. Four years later, when the Germans annexed Austria in 1938, the Count and his wife dramatically escaped the Gestapo, uh, getting out of Vienna in the Swiss ambassador's car. Uh, within a few weeks, he was, it was rather in his car, but with the Swiss ambassador's pennant, making it look like a diplomatic car uh, as they drove away. Within a few weeks, he was in London, speaking at Chatham House, warning all who would listen about, in Britain about the consequences of the Nazi takeover of Austria. Uh, he wasn't hard to be a prophet on once that had happened, but uh, once it happened, he was very clear in warning people that now you are going to get uh, a German Europe. You weren't going to get a European Germany. The next picture, please. He was so keen to travel around and try and whip up support in an anti-German, anti-Nazi uh, support that uh, he was taken as the um, model for Victor Laszlo in the film Casablanca. I don't know if many of you will remember the plot of Casablanca, but Victor Laszlo is the uh, Czech resistance hero who's interned in a concentration camp but escapes uh, to the consternation of his wife who is Ingrid Bergman who by then has perhaps started an affair and certainly is emotionally engaged uh, with uh, Humphrey Bogart uh, the man with the revolver in the front of the poster uh, and this count uh, who had excellent contacts with all the anti-Nazis in Brussels in, in Europe from Portugal to Poland uh, was taken as the model for Victor Laszlo, uh, who, if you remember in the film, uh, stirs everybody's hearts by getting them to sing the Marseillaise uh, and drown out Die Wacht am Rhein, which the half dozen Nazi soldiers are trying to sing in another part of Rick's bar. But it's not just rallying point for the resistance which the man represented. Uh, he did go on uh, to, in 1940, let me ask for the next slide, please, if we may. Yes, he was whisked out of Lisbon in this magnificent flying machine to New York, uh, 
just in a funny way, as, as Victor Laszlo was whisked out of uh, Casablanca to get to Lisbon in an airplane in the final shot of the film. But this, for the Count, was the start of a new chapter. He went to America, probably financed there by uh, various sources, but they would have been close to the Office of, the office of Special Services um, as it developed later. But we're just a few months before that's formally set up. So he's very close to a, a covert operation in a funny way, uh, being taken out, being saved out of Lisbon. Um, and he spends the rest of the year of the war in New York. Uh, let me see if I may, yes, the next slide please, because he has to try and persuade the man on the left who is President Roosevelt. Uh, and when President Roosevelt dies, his successor, Harry Truman on the right. And he has exactly the same message for both of them. This war is a war first against the Nazis, therefore you must be with Britain which indeed did happen. Roosevelt probably wanted that, it took a long time to get round to it because there was a lot of opposition in America against the idea. But uh, not only that, but the second war that you will have, or the opposition you will have, is against Russia, against the Soviet Union. Uh, behind the collapse of Germany will be a resurgent Soviet Union, which will dominate Europe, unless you, America, do something to prevent that. And this was the substance of a lot of correspondence between the Count and Churchill, whose position he was strongly supporting, because Roosevelt would not hear of an anti-Russian element in the alliance at that stage. Russia was still so vital for success in the Second World War. It was only when he died and the war in Europe was almost at an end that Harry Truman was welcoming to the ideas and the analysis that the Count brought forward and said, and the Count's analysis was that in the new situation after the war, Europe must unite. You must encourage from America the unification of Europe. Uh, and he got the president to actually declare publicly that the idea of a United States isn't, of the United States of Europe is an excellent idea. That's words which would never have crossed Roosevelt's lips. Um, if we have the next picture, please. This is the man who was, in a sense, the man in the middle. Uh, he was uh, the Count's closest British ally, was a close friend of Churchill, that is Leo Amory. And through him, the Count met Churchill before the war, even uh, going to uh, his country house. Uh, and coming back from America, he received a telegram from Churchill on board the small French ship he was traveling back on saying, please come straight away to my flat in London. I need to talk to you over lunch, uh, which he duly did. He was briefing Churchill just before his major speech in Zurich in September 1946, when he called for United States of Europe. Uh, and Churchill, generally speaking, reacted positively to the Count's suggestions because the Count could deliver things for Churchill that he himself and some of his political allies in Britain could not. The Count was still very well connected to all the cross-party support, both left and right, uh, that was anti-Nazi, and many of whom went back to form governments in the newly liberated countries. Um, so the Count was at Churchill's elbow for two or three years after the war, 47, 48, even 49, um, nudging him towards being more federalist, more uniting for Europe. Now, Churchill, famously was behind the European movement. It was, this has sprung from Churchill and uh, subsequently Duncan Sands work. Um, but the ambiguity of Churchill hovered over the opening, the beginnings of the European movement and slightly hovers over it still um, as to just how far it is encouraging very good relations between all Europeans or the big step, the federal union of Europe. And that ambiguity, which is still there, was clearly present uh, in 48, 49. And the Count turned away from Churchill, uh, disappointed by this degree of uh, ambiguity, to de Gaulle. And the next slide, please. This man had a quite different view on Europe. It's not the Europe of the narrative that has come from the European Union, which was founded by Jean Monnet and French politicians working closely on a shared sovereignty structure in Brussels. Uh, when 
de Gaulle came back to power uh, in 1958, uh, no, sorry, yes, 58, yes, running through to 69, um, the die had already been cast in Brussels. There was um, the three communities existed. He didn't undo them, even though he didn't like them, but what he tried to do was to undermine them in some way or to enclose them in a wider, better led structure, stronger or traditionally led pattern. And the Count turned to support de Gaulle in those last 10 years or so of his life, um, initially supporting de Gaulle's veto on Britain's entry, because Britain would have disturbed uh, the French concept of leadership for that bloc. But at the second, when de Gaulle moved to veto on the second occasion, he quarreled with de Gaulle. He didn't publicly break, but his correspondence with de Gaulle, which is extremely interesting, uh, reveals him trying to persuade him not to ban Britain a second time because that would weaken the Europe that would eventually then be created nonetheless. So the next picture, please. After his death, which took place just after Britain uh, under Edward Heath had uh, voted in the Commons to accept the principle of joining the, the European Union in the summer of 1972. Uh, he died well, somewhat unexpectedly, but uh, the recognition that he had received both in his lifetime and subsequently is illustrated here. Uh, this is a square very close to the Place de la Concorde in France, uh, it's a matter of a few hundred yards away. Uh, Place Richard, Richard de Coudenhouf Kalagi, fondateur de l'Union Pan Européenne. Uh, and here's on the anniversary of, I think, the 100th anniversary of his, of his birth, an Austrian postage stamp. Uh, his, his works are in the curriculum or were in the curriculum of schools and certainly in the universities across the continent. Uh, and the, uh, the ideas of the man live on. Uh, he got many, many prizes. The, the Nobel Prize may have eluded him, but he did at least coin a beautiful witticism about it when it eluded him for the 20th or 25th time of his being proposed for it. Uh, he said, well, better to have earned it, but not to have been awarded it, uh, than to have been awarded it, but not to have earned it. Still, streets, as I say, and squares are named after him across Europe and uh, university syllabuses as well. I think that, I'm, can we come to back to the speaker? I think we've finished with the pictures now. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, sure thing. <laughs> great. The, the Count left his mark, as you can see from what I've told you. It's an extraordinary story, totally unknown here. The man is, is unknown. And yet on the continent, he's well known. Um, Macron, for instance, was speaking at the Council of Europe um, a few years ago now, about six or seven years ago, seven or eight years ago, and quoted, quoted from Kudnu um, Kalagi. You, you cannot imagine a British minister going to the Council of Europe and quoting from Kudnu Kalagi. You wouldn't know who he was, um, let alone where he stood, what, what balancing he had to do to get to preserve the concept of a united Europe, see it through the Second World War, get it supported strongly by Truman after the war, um, uh, thereby hangs another tale, but we won't go into it. His, his idea of a united Europe uh, was structured through the European Parliamentary Union. Uh, Duncan Sands' concept was structured through what became the European movement, and there was a battle royal to get American funding. And the funding went to the European movement, it didn't go to the European Parliamentary Union. So the body which might have had more federal influence was sidelined and lacked finance, whereas the one which accepted the ambiguity of the standard British position right, was the one which saw the light of day and grew and has structured, strengthened and uh, is the structure which you all know today. Um, so there is the, the picture of it. Uh, what makes the man exceptional is that he called on Europeans to identify themselves as European, not to identify themselves as solely national. And he wasn't saying you're European, not German, or you're European, not French. You are both German and European. You are both British, even British and European. Um, uh, and you, you can bind, you can combine the nationalities, the sense of belonging to two entities. You do not have to make big choices that are oppositional. Europe is a consensual arrangement. Everybody is there because they share common values. 
hence my problem about Hungary and Poland from the very beginning. But once you share the common values, there is no conflict between your national and your European identity. And there should, could be, no conflict between policies nationally and policies at European level. That's why Brexit is a mistake, as it was quoted earlier, uh, and why we've had to go backwards rather than forwards. Now I have, um, let me see, two or three quick points, which are my wind up points. Hey, I'll do that and then slip over to questions and answers, please. Um, as I say, you don't have to give up a British identity to become a uh, European, nor do the French, the Italians, the Lithuanians or the Portuguese, quite frankly. The whole point is that we are sharing and sharing is greater than being separate. Um, but the, the, bigger, uh, the bigger argument, I think, that he was aware of and he made much of in his writings in the 20s and 30s, but has come up to us uh, overwhelmingly as the key argument now, is the technological changes drive the concentration of political control into ever bigger units. Um, as technology has moved, so borders have become less important, they've become irrelevant, they've become too small. Um, uh, the classic example I can give you is that if you take a low cost airline, you can fly anywhere in Europe within three or four hours. Um, a missile actually will do that in about four minutes. And if you pick up your phone from your pocket, you can be instantaneously in touch with anybody anywhere in Europe in, within a second. <laughs> So the technology has shifted so radically so fast that for us to hold on to structures which were created, in our case, partly for geographical terms, but essentially for historical reasons, uh, in the 17th, 18th century, really, when the United Kingdom became the United Kingdom, Germany much, much later, and it's shifted around quite a lot, in Italy in the middle of the 19th century, in France, well, from the 17th, 18th, but it's shifted around the edges and it's been wiped out now and then. Poland has been wiped out much more rigorously and has been reinstated. So all the others have had different national backgrounds to ours. We must understand each other better to realize why Europe is the solution and is not the problem. The problem is the nation state, the solution is Europe, not the way the Brits see it, so at least half the Brits see it and saw it at Brexit. They thought the nation state's the solution and Europe is the problem. The question was just the wrong way around. Thanks very much.